Yet another week where we find the melted circus peanut that is Donald J. Trump once again at the top of the news feed. In an interview aired on Fox last night, when asked by Brett Baer about the indictment, the dum-dum, who thanks to his malignant narcissism, couldn't shut his big mouth and essentially said, well, actually said, <laughs> that he didn't want to send the boxes back to Nara because they were his. Those were his great big beautiful boxes, okay? So unless we're all selectively stupid enough to forget that he said that the documents were planted by the FBI way, way back in more innocent times, it looks like he lied about that. Shocker. The more he talks, the worse it gets for him, and we all know that he doesn't have a shut-the-blank-up setting. So have a pen and paper handy, Jack Smith. In other news, more classes today, and that's not how shit works, Republican school. Today's lesson, Hunter Biden's plea deal. So just so we're all on the same page here, Hunter Biden reached a plea deal with federal prosecutors to resolve a five-year federal investigation into his failure to pay about $1 million in federal taxes and his purchase of a handgun in 2018. Under the agreement, he will plead guilty to a pair of misdemeanor tax charges. He was also charged with possessing a firearm while using illegal drugs, but those charges will be dismissed contingent upon his completion of a two-year probation. The individual in charge of this entire investigation and the resolution of it is U.S. Attorney for Delaware David Weiss, a Trump appointee as it so happens, which will invariably land him the nickname of Deep State or Rhino now. So the very same folks who've been pounding their chests about Joe Biden weaponizing the federal government by going after his rival blah blah as a result of special counsel Jack Smith's incredibly well-sourced, detailed, and extensively vetted indictment of their riding gourd god are now upset because, checks notes, that same president just had his Justice Department charge his own son with misdemeanors. Yes, I'm serious. The fact that just about every single legal expert is on TV and Twitter and their own substacks at this very moment saying that this was in fact harsher than typical sentences for such crimes is just inconvenient noise to the I can't hear you Magadonians. Because none of that stuff based in truth means that their guy, the one who stole our most closely guarded national security secrets, lied about stealing them, showed them to his pals, hid them in a chandelier shitter, will be magically exonerated in much the same way as he magically declassified documents so secret even their classifications had to be redacted. Shit just doesn't work like that. There was, in fact, some fucked up butterfly effect where if a guy you hate listens to his attorneys, a revolutionary idea for their dumb dumb of a deity, and reaches a plea deal, it means that it sets into motion some bullshit ripple effect where a guy you worship gets to walk away from being charged 37 times under the Espionage Act. See, shit just doesn't work like that. Okay, all of that out of the way, let's get to my interview with George Conway. We talked all about the indictment, but even more importantly, and especially in light of Trumpelstiltskin's performance on Fox last night, we talk about his narcissism, how that is what's really behind all of his criminality and basically all of his crazy. It's a great conversation, one I know you'll enjoy. Hi, George. <laughs> Hello, Joe. How are you? I'm great. Uh, How is Jersey? You know, Jersey's uh, representing now that we don't look like, you know, we live on the surface of Mars. It's good. Yeah. Now that the sun's out and I don't have to worry about wearing a mask outside. It's yeah. great. All right. Yeah. So um, let's talk about Trump. I, mean, I can't believe my, right? I can't believe my good fortune because we were supposed to have this conversation a little while back before last week kind of happened and last week was obviously crazy where we went from finding out that thanks to him really that he was that he'd received the target letter to you know stuff moving with this grand jury to finding out that he had been indicted to and... a photograph of documents in a chandelier in a, in a in a in a bathroom with a chandelier over the toilet yes <laughs> amazing keep... amazing progression well, can't make this so... stuff up well, so that's what I want to ask you about, and I, and I guess it's a perfect kind of. I don't like chandeliers in bathrooms. I <laughs> I, 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 I I'm glad you asked that question. And there wasn't just one; there were two. I call it the chandelier shitter. Um. Yeah. So, so that was a surprise. I think yeah. I don't think I don't think any of us. It feels like that Mad Lib scheme. You know, we all used to play was like put in a verb, yeah. put in an adjective. Chandelier shitter would definitely not have been in my dystopian bingo card, no. but. So that was surprising. 
But let's right. go back like a little bit in time to almost a year ago when yes, ma'am. the when we what, what's that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So we're going back to August eighth when the news broke that Mar-a-Lago yes. had been searched by the FBI. Yes. And then that was crazy enough because we could only speculate as to why. And then short right. order, we found out that it was related to classified right. documents. And then, of course, we were left to speculate. Like, And then we got little drips and drabs and more and more information came out over the course of the last year. But aside from the chandelier shitter, have there been any surprises from what you kind of could have imagined based on what you, we were looking at with the search and what the indictment revealed? Well, I mean, there, there are no surprises in the depth of derangement and an utter contempt for law that Trump showed in this entire investigation. Um, but the fa- the power of the actual evidence that the government came up with is just absolutely stunning. The fact that they were able to get testimony from Trump's lawyers um, by piercing the attorney-client privilege under the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege and through these video recordings of the military aide moving, the ex-military aide moving the boxes around and from the fact that he allowed himself to be recorded by by Mark Meadows' biographers um, while he was waving around allegedly a, a classified document and telling people that he didn't declassify it and they couldn't see it legally. Uh, it's just that's just an unbelievable proof that I mean it it makes the smoking gun tape, the single comment that Nixon made in the smoking gun tape, the famous smoking gun tape in 1974, uh, makes it look pales in comparison by by many orders of magnitude. So it's just really incredible. That said, the big moment when we knew how bad this was, was back in August when the government, basically because Trump insisted on it, released the bulk of the affidavit that the FBI had used to get a federal United States magistrate judge to issue that search warrant. And it was clear, at least to me at that point, and I think to a lot of people, that if this is just the tip of the iceberg, well, they have this guy dead to rights. And, and I think that's only been confirmed over the course of many months of the, of the dribs and drabs of information that was leaked by Trump's lawyers and the people around him because they knew about how bad it was as the investigation was progressed because their witnesses were going in and telling their stories to the FBI and to the grand jury. I mean, it really wasn't surprising how bad his conduct was, but the starkness of how of, of, the, of the level of evidentiary proof, thanks to the recording and thanks to Trump's cavalierness, is just absolutely stunning. Well, I want to talk about that cavalierness a little bit, because something that I feel like hasn't necessarily been coming up as much about why he was so brazenly cavalier is something you talk about. You put on my radar first, which was narcissism. Right. So. I didn't even know I'd heard that word, you know, bantered about all my life, but I didn't know what it was. And you put right. it, you made it very clear, brought it into focus for me, which actually changed. Yeah, I didn't my know anything. Life. I, I actually didn't know. I, I, I really didn't understand it until I started reading about Trump. And then I, I not only understood it with it, not only provided a clear explanation of why Trump does the things he does and, and what he's going to do next. It almost me, me, it me almost means you can expect what he is going to do in some ways. He's almost predictable. Um, it also, you know, you, you you realize that you you know you've gone through life, and yeah, I know these characteristics, and I, I I've had to deal with people in my life and work and family situations who who you know who have similar tendencies. It's it's it, I I you know I I confess I really went through five decades of my life plus without knowing anything about it, and now. I understand how it relates to a lot of bad things that are going on in our society today and particularly in politics. Yeah. I mean, to your point, because I didn't really know what it was once that once I had that lens to view people and interactions and. Right. And it's like you, there are some people that you just say, oh my gosh, check, check, (laughs) check, check, check. Yeah. That's and why his, this, that's why, that's why, that's why he was so hard to deal with my boss, you know, and, and, and so on. 
Right, right. That's, or my that was ex- totally he did he did all of these things. Yeah. Right. And then so many times it's hindsight. Right. And then you're already and you, you and you start replaying like, oh God, I remember the time I you know gave the boss this document and he did this and he said that. <laughs> right. And... Right. But in in Trump's case, he is what you call a malignant narcissist, right? Correct. A and narcissistic so, sociopath. Right. So the fact, so when you, so it's almost, I mean, it's almost SNL beyond parody, like the right. things he said right. on tape about right. this is super secret. I'm not supposed to have this. Look what right. I have. Right. And the, and the Millie stuff where he's like, this proves I'm right. And he's right. wrong. Right. All of that. All right. of that. I mean, it's, it's a. Right. It's, it's the, it's, it's a combination of the narcissism and the sociopathy. The narcissism led him to take the stuff because everything is all about him and everything belongs to him. Everything he touches, everyone who works for him belongs to him. Everyone should do what he says. And so, you know, he's this five-year-old. It's like, this is, these are my toys. I'm taking them <laughs> with me. Right. And, I, you know, people say, oh, well, he, he probably thought about selling them. No, 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 no. That's the sociopathy part was sociopaths don't plan. They are impulsive. They, they don't plan ahead. Um, sociopaths and psychopaths. And they don't follow laws and rules. They don't think they apply to them. And they're, they're not, you know, they'll do anything to lie, cheat and steal to get what they want. And, you know, the fact that he he took these documents and started waving them around, he, his view is the law doesn't apply to me and these are mine and I can use them to my benefit. I don't have any idea how I'm going to use them. And it, he's totally impulsive. Um, and if somebody had offered him money for it, he probably would have taken it. But, he, you know, he just didn't. He, he's just but he lives from moment to moment. I mean, and you can just see all that in the evidence against him. It's just you can see the narcissism and you can see the sociopathy. Yeah. I mean, to your point about <laughs> not planning it's like oh god move the boxes move them again move them again um right. you know right. uh, move there's them no the there's no there's no organization no rhyme no reason to 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 what he wants to do with the documents he he randomly takes them places he randomly moves them around he has no plan for hiding them it, it's it's absolutely insane and there and the difference now why he's in danger more than ever before is that in the earlier stages of his life, there were people to protect him. Yeah. As Mary Trump wrote in her excellent book about her uncle, Trump was essentially institutionalized his entire life. He had institutions around him, his family, his business, and then the executive branch of the United States of America to surround him and protect him from himself and to insulate him from responsibility for his misconduct and now you know he's exhausted all of those resources you know he's gone through all these lawyers he's gone through all these people he's wrought all this destruction and he's got nobody who's functioning who's functional around him i mean remember don mcgann the white house counsel by threatening to resign a couple of times or at least once uh, and refusing to do things that trump had asked um saved trump um, he, from from far more serious uh, 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 criminality in the Mueller investigation, uh, he doesn't have people like that around him. Now. He's got Boris Epstein, who doesn't, you know, who never, who who has a law degree but never practiced law. He's he's he has he has these second and third and fourth rate lawyers, um, and the fourth rate and third and, and fourth rate and third rate lawyers have either been all go- were all gone already or ended up being witnesses against him and the, the the halfway decent lawyers that he had quit the other day yeah um so you know he, he's got nobody to protect him anymore he's been denuded of of all of the mechanisms and the people around him that protect him he has no consigliere like a mob boss does because he's too dumb to retain one right and, it's interesting he's blown through them right so my son is in seventh grade leo's in seventh grade and he's learning a little bit about organized crime in school a little bit he's curious about it and and we were talking about it in the context of trump you know i've always thought as stupid as he is and he is really endlessly pretty stupid like honestly it's shocking it's almost no it is shocking you know it is impressive but he's managed to always michael cohen for instance it always feels like someone else he has a he has a reptilian instinct an ability to you know stay alive and get other people to do things for him it's just it's just instinctual it's not intelligence 
Well, it's a right. kind of it's a kind of reptilian intelligence, if you will. <laughs> I'm no, never seriously. gonna. Yeah, seriously. I mean, well, so I, in this I, case, I, I mean that in all seriousness. You know, I get. I, I love that. I'm going to use that. Probably going to steal it. But in this case, he didn't do that. He was, is it, is it because he's actually, is it, is it because the institutions are gone and the people to yes, protect him are gone? I think it's because I think he's, I think he's, he's been decompensating for a long time, mm-hmm. which is the technical term for he is losing, he's losing it. Yeah. But he's also just sort of, you know, because he's been losing it, he's been more difficult to deal with and, and, and people can't deal with him. And so the quality of the people, both intellectually and morally around him has declined i mean he's you know he did have some decent people around him at at at, at various times mm-hmm. i mean you know people who are did things that they probably maybe shouldn't have done shouldn't have stuck with him so so long yeah. but intelligent people you know who who were law abiding and he just blew through those and who told him you know would tell him to do the right thing and he would ignore them um you know and, and he just blew he's blown through all of those people and even right. the you know, even the ones who are who are really protective of him, um, and were willing to go to some lengths to protect him, like uh, uh, Bill Barr, they, you know, you, you know, he he basically says that the government got has Trump dead to rights now, right? So, so I want to talk a little bit about what he what he took, right? What he had, what he retained, right. what he hid, and all that, because a high percentage of the documents related to real world military, like warfighter issues, yeah. So disclosures of those things literally put the U.S. military at risk. Um, and sources and methods right. and so on, yes. So how does that play to, it's clearly not making the case to the base. They don't give a shit, right? They don't, they're not going to move. They don't care. I don't think any right. of this, I don't think any of this, he could club a litter of baby seals with one hand while jerking off Kim Jong-un with the other and uh, selling nuclear secrets to Putin at the same time. And I don't think they that move. That is still really, I, I'm closing this. <laughs> I'm closing my laptop. You know, that is a, but you, that is but you such know a there disgusting. Would, that's such know. a disgusting image, Joe. But you know, is this I mean, po- is this podcast have a rating? <laughs> I have no idea. It's me. I an hope MPAA that... rating. I, like, <laughs> you know, that, that, you just went. You just blew through NC seventeen. Well, one of the places this streams is on Pornhub. So I mean, oh, do all with right, that okay. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, 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 when, but, when is but, Becky but, Sue on there? I don't know. <laughs> well, Becky Sue knows that she would send him her last government assistance check if he, even if he did all that. <laughs> That's the thing. So, like, they. Well, she'd have gonna... to. She'd have, yeah. She'd have to skimp on halter tops and, and, and... <laughs> well, halter tops and uh, <laughs> nails. Yeah, nail but, polish. Yeah. Right. So, so, so we all know that <laughs> that's not. They're not going to budge. They're still going to send him their insulin checks every month. Nothing's going to change. It doesn't matter what he does. But the jury that might be, it's going to be difficult to avoid having anyone on that jury in South Florida who isn't a little bit fond of Donald Trump, right? Like we saw in right. New York, there were there were Trumpers. On that jury in New York, correct, and and that's sort of the that's the double edged sword, right? Look, I think the evidence is so strong that even if you had the most diehard Trumper on on the jury, one or two, you're not going to get a unanimous verdict for Trump. So he's never going to be acquitted. Uh, He will, you know, the best he can do. In a criminal jury trial, and in, I think this this case, if the if the case, if Judge Cannon or whoever presides doesn't let this case go to trial, they'll certainly get reversed by the Eleventh Circuit. Um, I think that there is no way he can get a favorable verdict. The best he can do is a hung jury, but that all that does is entitle the government to retrial, the, retry mm. the case, and try <laughs> the case again, and you know see if they get a better jury the next time. And but the point you make about the New York jury in the Eugene Carroll case is a very, very good one. That was not you know, people assume it was on Manhattan jury, but it actually, you know, it's a jury from the United States in the in the veneer of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, which includes not just Manhattan and the Bronx, but includes Westchester County, Putnam County, Orange County. It includes some rural, relatively or, or suburban and rural counties that are to some extent Trumpy. Mm-hmm. And there was one juror in particular on that jury who was a adherent of a right-wing podcast by a guy named Tim Poole. Mm-hmm. I know him. Told, and told the court in the voir dire that he got all of his news, all of his news from this right-wing crazy po- conspiratorial podcast. Mm-hmm and pro-Trump podcast. And 
this jury basically in two hours or two or three hours uh, and, and, and stopping for lunch gave Jean Carroll $5 million for, for have, her having been sexually abused and defamed by Donald Trump. And this guy was, you know, voted with them. And I think that, you know, I do think that jurors take their roles seriously. And I think, I think the, even if there are some Republican voters or Trump voters on that panel, I don't necessarily think that he is going to get their votes when they actually have to sit solemnly in a jury box after having taken an oath uh, in front of a federal judge before the United States flag um, with, with in, a, in a court of law. Uh, I, I think I don't necessarily think that they're going to obstruct the cause of justice. I think I think I think there are I, I, I think there are going to be very few people who will basically refuse to listen to the evidence. Yeah, but he may evidence. get one. He may get lucky. He may get one. Or, but but the most that gets him is another jury. Right. And when they're looking at I mean, you see the words nuclear capabilities. I mean, obviously, they're not going to be able to see what exactly was contained in well the that's not that's not true um there are i mean that one of the the one di difficult aspect of this case is that it does involve classified information but there are procedures under something called the classified information protection act that are followed in criminal prosecutions um and that are complex but they allow classified information to be presented to the jury and what the what the government had to do when preparing this indictment was to go to each of the agencies that prepared the classified information that Trump had and disseminated that information and say, okay, which of these documents would you be okay with us using confidentially in court pursuant to this, the procedures of this act? And so they picked out 30 plus documents. I forget how many, um, you know, each being a separate count under the Espionage Act. And they picked out some documents and those documents, under the law, all the lawyers have to have security clearances, mm. both the ones prosecuting the case and the defense lawyers. He, right now, he doesn't have any defense lawyers. We'll see what he comes up with. They have to have security clearances. The judge does not have to have a security clearance under the law because the judge is doing the judge. And the jury doesn't. But all, everybody else in the courtroom will have to have a security clearance. And they can present, they have decided these are the documents that they will they won't read them in open court where the press and, and the audience can hear, but they will be shown to the jury. And if there is testimony about the contents of this document, there are procedures whereby the jury can listen on private headsets um, uh, and, and, and listen without the world hearing it. That said, you know, there is always a risk. There is something called gray mail where people who, who, who are being prosecuted or investigated for doing bad things with extremely, extremely sensitive documents sort of have the government over a barrel because the government really doesn't want to risk the exposure. But here you, they, they, have, they, 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 they have to take some risk because the, the, the crimes here were so serious. I, that's crazy because it feels as though it sort of imperils the information even further, which yes. is really sad and well, scary. It, 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 you no, know, that's, that's one of the problems with, with yeah. this kind of misconduct. And, and the government is forced to, you know, deal with the fact that not only was this stuff available to anybody who might have walked into a bathroom upstairs at a, at a, at a, at a social club, um, but that, you know, there is some risk in presenting this material to a, to a jury that, that it might escape their control, the government's control. So there's another layer here that people are kind of my father, ex-father-in-law came up to me yesterday. He's like, I was feeling really good about things until I realized that Judge Cannon was the judge assigned to this case. And there's a lot of people saying right now that this is a catastrophe. Right. So so my question is about Judge Cannon. First of all, it's problematic, I guess. Right. Like on its it, face. It, it, it's 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 not ideal. Let's let's put it that way. So what could she potentially do that would interfere is there any recourse if she does anything? Obviously, like you said, they could get another jury, I guess. But can they get another judge? Is the 11th look, Circuit, like, what happens here? Well, look, they, they if she does anything wild, like she did last time, there may be an issue that prosecutors would be able to take up to the Court of Appeals. It may, even if it's not necessarily 
ordinarily appealable if her conduct is so outrageous and lawless that it rises to something called you know the mandamus standard um, they could get a court even if it's not normally appealable uh, the order that to to reverse her and and also the jo the the court would have the discretion to say well this was so bad uh, we think this it's best to reassign this to another judge that 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 can happen i've seen that i clerked on a U.S. Court of Appeals in New York, and there I, there were a couple of cases that I saw where the court did that, where just some judge was just so you know he was just just such the wrong judge of in for a case, and and so biased in a particular case and out of control that they just said you know we were resigning, you know, we asked the chief judge of the district of the Eastern District of New York or wherever to to resign this case. So you know that could happen. Um, it could also happen that. Um, I, I think the best way, her best way out of the case would, would be that, you know, this case has to be tried in Miami mm. because Miami apparently is the only courthouse in that district, the Southern District of Florida, that has, that is geared up for the security measures that are going to be needed to conduct proceedings in this case. Uh, the West Palm Beach uh, courthouse uh, is, has only like three judges and it's a, it's a shithole, apparently, an old <laughs> shithole. Um, not to use the legal term. Uh, <laughs> and and then there's this, you know, and Judge Cannon is who, who sits, you know, hears cases from West Palm Beach, sits in another courthouse in Fort Pierce, which is even smaller. And so she's got to travel all the way to Miami to try this case and to conduct proceedings in this case to the extent she doesn't do so, I guess, by Zoom or remotely from her, from her um, chandelier bathroom. I don't know. Uh, from her <laughs> From her, from her courtroom in, or chambers in in Fort Pierce, uh, so you know, I mean, it would make sense for her to give the case up to a Miami judge. I don't right. know if she's going to do that. I mean, but she might think if she were if she were smart, like no one's going to like me here. I I, I I I I've had enough of this. I don't want to <laughs> do this again. On the other hand, um, she if she's a glutton for punishment, she could try to help Trump again. Uh, on the other hand, she might try to redeem herself mm. um, after having been what what we lawyers call bench slapped by the Court of Appeals in the prior litigation. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's too early to say, you know, what's going to happen here and what the impact of the judicial assignment is. Um, but the way the only way I think a judge could impair or impede the government's case would be by being slow. Mm -hmm. I don't think a judge could lawfully dismiss the indictment or direct a verdict for um, the government and get rid of the case and not present it to a jury. Um, but that said, you know, the government, you know, if, if and, I, and I don't think, as I said, the government, I think the government is so, has such strong evidence that I just don't think that a jury will enter a verdict for Trump, which means that he's still, he's still potentially on the hook in a second retrial. So I want to talk about timing because, you know, you were talking about that she one of the only few things she could do if she wanted to would be to slow it down. What are we right. looking at? Like, what are we looking at time wise in terms well, that's of the thing? It, that's right. the thing. I mean, that's the that's the thing where the judge makes a difference. I think, you know, a smart and determined judge who is looking to protect the best interests of the legal system and the country uh, would understand that. The significance of this case is such that it should have priority and it should be brought to trial as soon as possible. And, you know, consistent with the um, and, and consistent with the Speedy Trial Act, which actually requires that in criminal cases and consistent with the defendant's due process rights. So I think a judge, a good judge like the judge in New York who handled the E. Jean Kaplan case, Judge Lewis Kaplan, um, could make this case go relatively quickly. And I think a judge had the judge this case been brought, which apparently it really could not have in the District of Columbia for venue. Uh, the judges there are very familiar with the procedures protecting classified information. You know, a good, smart, experienced judge, I think, could get this case tried in a year or slightly less, I think. Um, in you know, that's just a gut um feeling or instinct. And I think prosecutors, ex-prosecutors agree with that if you had the right judge. I think a case like this in the ordinary course with a, before a slow judge could take a, more than 
18 months, the time between now and the 2024 presidential election. And that I think would, if I were Trump and I were unwilling, psychologically, pathologically incapable of admitting guilt and pleading and throwing myself at the mercy of the court and the government, um, I would play for delay and try to get mm. myself elected president. And then I, you know, once he's elected president, I don't think he could be in incarcerated for this conduct. And he could, you know, and there's an, I don't think he could pardon himself, but he'll try. Mm. Right. We know that about him. He'll definitely try. But I also don't think, I don't think he will, I, I don't think he will be elected. I think he might get, he'll get the nomination, but I don't think he'll be elected. I hope he'll yeah. I agree with you about both of those things. Um, but then there's also these questions about the other investigations and potential. Well, there is an Correct. indictment out there. They're going to trial in March in New York, right? Correct. And he's, you know, I, I think Jean Carroll is probably going to have, uh, it's a civil case, but I, I think her other case against Trump, which was actually the first case that she brought, is probably going to be heard by a jury in the fall. Uh, you have the... Fulton County, Georgia district attorney investigation, the Fonnie Willis investigation, which we are reasonably certain or reasonably, it's reasonably likely that an indictment will be brought in Fulton County in July um, because they, they warned law enforcement um, to be prepared to gear up in Atlanta for it. And then, you know, we have... Um, Special Counsel Jack Smith also conducting the investigation into the events leading up to and including January 6th, where Trump also has exposure and where we we keep wondering whether, you know, a guy like Mark Meadows, who was the traffic cop that day for communications with Trump, has assisted the government. We That's the sort of the $64 million question there. And, you know, he could be charged there as well. And that would be in the District of Columbia. And that would be before um, a much better, I think, a much better jury pool for the government than in Florida. Is it conceivable that Jack Smith brings these two indictments at the same time? Yeah, I think I think I think that he will. I, I, I think he, you know, he, he, he is known to be a bulldozer and very aggressive and efficient. And I think we saw that in the pleading that was filed, the indictment that was filed last week and, and presented, that will be presented on, on Tuesday. And um, I don't think he's messing around. And if he thinks that he has a tr case ready to go against Trump on the January 6th stuff and he has it ready to go this summer, he'd, he'd indict this summer. I don't know where they're... Uh, how you know how close he feels he is? I, nobody knows that. Only mm -hmm. he and his, his his secretive team would know. But I don't think he would hesitate in bringing more than one case at once. I think he has the reason. I, mean, I, I think that Merrick Garland has probably devoted, made clear that he's devoting to um, Smith the resources that wh whatever it takes for Smith to to do his job. And and I think that's that's commendable. Right. And obviously, without Mark Meadows, January 6th is a very different case to prove. Um, it's different because you don't have, well, maybe you do with Mark Meadows, like an audio recording. Of, well, like, yeah, Trump. you know, that's right. I mean, that's the thing about this. The, the Trump, the Trump documents case is you just basically, you know, he's been denuded of all his protections and his the people around him. And he basically was him directly directing this guy, this ex-military aide, Walt Nauta. Um, to move these boxes around and haphazardly. I mean, it's almost as if like, you know, Richard Nixon had been at the Watergate Hotel handing the electrical tape to Howard Hunt or whoever, whoever the, or whoever the plumbers were. Right. So, you know, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. Yeah, it's stunning. Do you think there's any, I'm going to wrap up in a second, but do you think there's any, obviously there's a play to get now to, is that his name? Is that how you say it? To flip, right? I mean, obviously. Would well, they I think they, I think the government has already played that card. And for whatever reason, I think quite unwisely, he didn't, didn't plead, um, probably because he would have been required to serve prison time. Mm. And I think now he's in much greater jeopardy. And, and I think his ability to get a reduced sentence is 
very low. Um, and I guess that means that's probably part of why his incentive to, to lead is not all that great because um, there is so much evidence against him and against Trump. The government really doesn't need now to prove its case. It's, it's, got, right. it's got video, it's got emails, it's got audio, it's got uh, lawyers' recollections um, recorded. Um, pictures. And audio and pictures. I, you know, I, 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 Nauda doesn't really add that much. He had truth. his shot. He had yeah. his chance. He, and he, 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 he had his chance to come clean. And as it's shown in the indictment, he lied to the FBI and then he didn't take it back. Mm. And I, you know, so they have him, you know, they have him for false statements. They have him for obstruction. <laughs> they have him for conspiracy. They have him for, you know, the, uh, for or everything Trump did. I always play this in my mind whenever stuff like this happens. And it's like Rick Wilson said, everything that Trump touches dies. And you see it time no. after time. And, and, after and, time. and, and, and now, to, I mean, I was listening to, I was listening on the radio in the car on Friday to CNN and Aaron Burnett was interviewing Ty Cobb, who you may recall was mm -hmm. a special in-house White House counsel helping um, Trump defend the Mueller investigation. He's a very smart and capable guy. And he thinks that Trump, the government has Trump dead to rights in this documents case. He knows he worked with Nauta because Nauta was in the West Wing and Nauta was a was kind of a gopher there. And then he later became Trump's body man. And he described Nauta as basically being a good man, a nice guy who, you know, just followed the directions of a raw, a bad human being and got himself into trouble because he was too loyal. And it's really sad. It's really sad. I mean, you just add him to the heap of people who 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 gave their loyalty to Donald Trump and ended up paying a heavy price for it. And it's it's in in some cases it's kind of sad and pathetic. And I think in the Nauta case is is one of them. Everyone is disposable and everyone thinks they won't be. They all think right. they'll be the one. Right. Because they're like, oh, they're they, you know, they they <laughs> they glow in the in the narcissistic light. Because, mm -hmm. right. you know, you right. one of the things we learned, you and I have learned about narcissists over the last years, is they're very, they're very seductive people. Mm -hmm. They draw you in and they, you know, and I remember this when I, when, when I first had dealings with Trump personally, uh, 17 years ago, relating to a condo dispute at the building I was, uh, had a condo in, which was a Trump building. You know, he was very, you know, he was very flattering. He called me up and told, you know, he said all these nice things to me. It was very, very charming. Mm -hmm. And and you could see how that you could play to somebody's ego, particularly if you use president of the United States, you get to go into the West Wing every day, you get to fly in Air Force One. It's a, it's a, he's a very corrupting influence. And, but in the end of the day, he's a, he's a very destructive influence. Yeah. He leaves a wake of, of destroyed lives. Um and everything he does. And Walt Nauta is just, you said, and just another name on that list. Another casualty. It's a long list. So, well, <laughs> thank you for joining me. Yeah. I, I know we've always often, fun. Yeah. Always we've fun. Often, it sucks. It sucks to have to have these conversations yes. because and we should be, we should be having these conversations with alcohol. I think yeah. you, know, you, know, <laughs> you, you should be, this should be the, the drunk Becky Sue podcast oh becky sue does like to drink every now and yeah, then she but does. She drank... she don't say it's just, just american american whiskey yeah american well no whiskey. well she not, did not, she... not any of this foreign stuff well what she did because she no was... no none of this tequila <laughs> that mexico don't no, send us their no best. no that's right this drinks no she bought up a bunch of bottle light to yeah. the woke lib mob and she's drinking it because she's smarter than the ones who are shooting it so she's drinking her Bud Light. That's what she's doing. All right. I, I would have thought Bucky, Be Becky Sue would have gone out and getting Coors Light, but all right. No, no. She she knows how, just how to stick it to them lib woke mob radicals, right. Marxists, and that's how she's doing it. Because that's what she saw in her QAnon group. Well, on I mean, she's good for her. She's you know, <laughs> she going that people like Becky Sue are going to keep 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 the keep the woke mob from destroying this country. Well, one thing she knows for sure yeah. is that Donald J. Trump is still our president. <laughs> he is still our president. He will always be my always. president. Always, and that always. guy living in the White House pretending yeah. he's Joe Biden, he's wearing a mask. It's really Jim Carrey, and we all know it. He's <laughs> right, because, you know, I mean, the real but Joe Biden, he 
he ain't got a marble to play with. No. And so somebody, <laughs> somebody's running the show there playing That's Dark right. Brandon. Okay, <laughs> that ain't that ain't Biden. No. No, Actually, Biden's no at Gitmo sure with Hillary and Epstein. Well, that's where he should be. He should be there in Gitmo. I think I think President Trump, when he gets back in there, he's going to take care of that. That's right, because he's a patriot. Yep. yep. Well, yep. <laughs> on that note. Oh, yeah, we can do this. We can do we can do a show just doing that. Okay. Oh, and Ruby wants to go out. So that's a perfect time yeah. to wrap All things right. up. Thank right. you, George. It's been fun. Thank Have you. a good Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank you, too. Bye. Thanks for joining me. And if you are listening to the Are You Effing Kidding Me podcast, make sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe below. Oops. LetMajorityRule.org is a project of the Marvin Lucas Super PAC, which is responsible for and paid for this ad and is not affiliated with or authorized by any political campaign or candidate or candidate's committee.